So yeah, Ross, on to the best and worst. Best and worst of 2023. Yeah, um, which way should we do this? Should we go worst first? Uh, I think second we should, the best? I think we should go best first. Okay. <laughs> let's well, maybe, let's maybe go up on a high okay. and then we'll just... No. Okay. So... <laughs> you go it, first. You go first. Well, no, no. You go first. Ah, oh, damn it. No. Okay. I do have a list. Um, we do a podcast called Eat, Sleep, Move, Your Repeat with Brent, your co-host, who's lovely and is sitting off camera. Oh, he's amazing. Uh, anyway... Um, that podcast, we, we recorded our podcast yesterday, which was the last podcast of uh, 2023, yep. and we actually did discuss this. And I very kindly sent Brent at about midnight the night before we go to air um, a list of 200 films. I said, look, here's some of the films that actually released. Yeah, we haven't got time for 200 films. No. <laughs> <laughs> I said, could you just quickly have a look through this and tell me what your worst are? Have you seen are? 200 films this year? I haven't seen. To, who, who's got the time? I've probably seen about 100. That's still pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I, I was looking at mine of maybe 40. I, I spend a lot of time at night. I, I'm yeah. older now, so I yeah. spend a lot of time not sleeping. Okay. So I, I watch a lot of movies. Okay. Um, legitimately, folks. Yeah. None of this pirate rubbish. Yeah. Uh, okay, so movies that I actually uh, enjoyed this year. And, and I've, I've gone with a kind of eclectic mix because I could pick, you know, the obvious top yeah. tier ones, but yeah. the ones that made the most money, but that's not necessarily necessarily the best film. So my movies were, okay, John Wick Chapter 4. Mm -hmm. It was... A very solid fourth film in a franchise, which usually by the time you get to four, diminishing are returns, diminishing that, returns, a hundred percent. Not only did it come out very, very well, and given you know Keanu's age, he did extremely well. He's still doing all the stunts himself. He still does a lot of that work. I thought the film was great. I thought it was entertaining, and it's also now spawning a secondary franchise mm. into twenty twenty four with Ballerina and. Overall, I thought that film was actually quite good. What were your thoughts on John Wick? I haven't seen John Wick 4, so I can't answer it. But my thoughts on the success of the franchise, I feel like there are some parallels with the Fast and Furious franchise, which I do feel is kind of... Played out. Played out now. But but interestingly, both times the first films came out on a reasonably low budget, they hit hard with fans, and it's been able to spiral positively into mm. bigger budgets for each film. So there's probably... The ability to do better CGI or, or, or whatever effects or writing, you know, all the things that cost a little bit more money to create a, the ability to make at least an equivalent, if not better, than the previous film mm. product. And then also the ability to create offshoots. But you've got to build the fan base first. You can't always just buy a fan base with your first film. No. Barbie, exception. Yeah. But John Wick 4, um, we had our, our end of year staff party the other night, and it came up a couple of times. There are a couple of fans in my crew. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, You'll have to that's, reach out and ask if you can screen it for them. That's all I can really say. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Look, what's next? Uh, for me, okay, this is going on a real tangent now. Sound of Freedom. Yep. I thought Sound of Freedom was a really interesting film. Yep. There was so much hype. There was so much um, controversy. There was so much conspiracy around a huge this movie. Of talk around the film, um, yeah. But the film itself had none of that. Mm. The film itself stood on its own two feet. Mm. It was a good film. It dealt with some tough subject matter. But overall, on a budget of around $15 million mm. that they did the film, and then they filmed it in like 2017. Yep. So that's $2017, not uh, subject yep. to inflation. Um, I thought that the film was incredibly good. Mm. Like, and I'm, I'm not a religious person. I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not necessarily um, focused on that space or looking into that film but I sat down there with a very open mind and I watched it and I was like putting all that hype and all the stuff you'd heard a before difficult the thing movie. to do I think yeah. I've got to give you a little bit of credit to sit down and watch a film like that with impartiality because I do feel like that the audience for that film were very invested in the uh, in the main invested around the talk around the film yes. and people who didn't want to see it were very much invested in I don't want to see it because of all the talk so yeah and I do think that is a little bit of a sort of macro world issue that we have sort of uh, have had develop in the last few years around um, you know left right conspiracy non conspiracy you know mm. so I, I credit you for raising that as one of your films of the year and being able to see it without actually thinking too much and just going to see a movie for Honest movie's merit. sake. And you're not the yeah. only person who's told me that. So, um, Oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah, I credit. must be all right then. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> look, I think the film was interesting because it just it dealt with some really tough subject matter. But, but you're right, the audience for that film were actually very partisan. And what was sad about it was 
when we didn't initially get the film, because again, we talk about the fact that we book stuff quite far in advance yep. and we have already made commitments, yep. pre-committed. Um, I think it was just around just pre-school holidays or mm. coming into the school Which holidays from memory. Yeah. So we pretty much booked up and then we were getting hate email and mm. hate phone calls mm. and the sort of thing that actually surprises you, you go, well, I shouldn't say it surprises you in this day and age because you hear so much of this going on, but the, the audience were angry and abusive about the fact we wouldn't take the film. And we would say, look, we, we, we want to take the film, but the film, um, and you probably remember this, the film was dropped on us like with 24 hours notice yep. that it was available. Yep. Um, and we were all at a convention mm. at the time. So you shouted it out, and the, the, I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, "Oh, hey guys, <laughs> just thought you might like to know yeah. they've just dropped this movie on us." Yeah. Um, and everybody picked their phone up and did the exact same thing yeah. I did. They contacted their cinema and said, "When can we make some yeah. space?" Yeah. Um, but the audience were angry because that audience, that film, hadn't been programmed for um, distribution worldwide. It was mm. only in America and it was only in England at the time. And they were, go "Why aren't you playing this film?" And because it, it had already opened a month in advance, and they were, "Why aren't you playing it?" And so there was a very angry audience out there. And you know, hats off to them. They wanted to see this movie, and unfortunately, they could, wouldn't accept because we became part of the conspiracy, which mm. was insane. Mm. We were stopping them from seeing the mm. film, and we were like, "No, no, we just haven't been offered it. Yeah. We can't play it until yeah. we're offered it." Yeah. So anyway. Thought the film was good. Yeah, interesting, was... interesting call. And I love it that you watched the film on its own merits. Hmm. I hadn't thought about it in terms of lists or anything because I haven't thought too long and hard about my lists of best and worst. But a very interesting time to be running a cinema. Yeah, matter. definitely. Yeah. And, and, and more of that to come, I believe. Um, look, the next one on my list was Air, hmm. which was... Um, obviously with uh, Matt Damon mm -hmm. and I thought that film was really really good it didn't make a lot of money it was it went under the radar yep. a lot because of other movies like Barbie and stuff coming out, out around that time mm. and but I thought it was just an, a nice sort of film um, it dealt with a shoe brand very uninspiring story but mm. for, from a from a I don't, I don't know, high level perspective but when you actually went and saw the film it was actually really intriguing mm. about how the Nike brand was on the, you know, literally on the bones of, of the business. And they were looking at actually phasing out that brand as a, as a the shoe brand for, um, because they couldn't make or break into that market. Mm. You know, it was controlled by Adidas. It was yep. controlled by um, New Balance and Converse. They couldn't get into that market. And they were literally going, you know, we'll just stop making basketball shoes. And then one guy said, you know what, let's make a shoe yep. and make it around one player which yeah. had never been done so it was actually a really interesting film. i don't think you can underestimate the the brand power of jordan not only worldwide but in new zealand i mean mm. you you see huge amounts of kids teenagers even adults wearing jordans wearing bulls shirts and stuff and that's he's been retired for a couple of decades now yeah and that is off the back of one man's ip it's pretty incredible yeah, yeah. amazing yep. um next film for me was asteroid city yep I thought Asteroid City was amazing. I like Wes Anderson films. I think that they are quirky and they are fun and they are delightful and they create a, a different kind of buzz. Mm. And again, I, I try and watch my movies with an audience. Yep. I mean, uh, we're lucky enough to sometimes be able to see these movies in advance in a, in a sort of hermetically sealed environment where we're sitting with a whole lot of other industry people. Yep. And everybody comes out and they all nod and they yes. go up to the studio and they'll say, oh, that was the best film I've ever seen. Mm. And secretly they're going, God, that was awful. I tend to, you know, call it how I see it. <laughs> so um, if, so um, studios know this about me, that if I think the movie was garbage, I say, oh, that was rubbish. Yep. You know, really, it wasn't great. Yep. But again, um, Asteroid City, I, I like watching those with audiences and I like watching what the audiences are doing. I like listening to where they laugh and mm. where they don't laugh. And it's like when you watch a kid's film, the Adults laugh at some bits and then sure. the kids laugh yep. at others and then there's other bits where everybody laughs at the same yep. time. So I think that that's kind of cool. And Asteroid City was cool because I was just in a movie theatre with a bunch of people and they all had this really good experience. And uh, when they leave, I always ask people, hi, uh, I happen to own the cinema, what do you think of the movie? Oh, well, sometimes I don't even tell them, I just randomly say, what do you think of that movie? Yep. And they go, you know, great, and they love that shared experience. And it is quirky, and like Wes Anderson films. Interesting that you mentioned that film, because I would not put that on my best of the year. I wouldn't put it on my worst of, but I'd put it in the sort of middle. I thought that the film looked incredible, and we actually had a podcast conversation about what I believe Wes should be thinking about doing in the future. Mm. I feel like, or well, my comment previously was that he's clocked Wes Anderson, and that he has basically nailed his look, and I would love to see Wes Anderson do a Barbie film or do a 
Marvels. Uh, uh, do- <laughs> I would love to see him just go out on a limb and do something different yeah. because it would be really interesting to see. Murder mystery or something. Yeah, and, and but not nec- maybe do a studio film mm. because I feel like that for me would be interesting. I, I love his films, but his my favorite Wes Anderson films are very much in the past. Yeah. I feel like he 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 should do something slightly different because he has he can't do Wes Anderson any better now. Yeah. Um, I thought it had its merits, but um, yeah, middle, middle, middle of the pack for me when it comes to Wes Anderson films. Yeah, um, look, and my, my last one actually, and this I have you to thank for this, just so uh-huh. you know. Okay, because uh, I watched this is news po- to me. Yes, because I watched the podcast. It's unscripted, folks. Um, I watched the podcast, uh, and you mentioned Marcel the, the Shell with shoes on, yes. which was coming up right in at the, the start festival of the year. right at the start of the year, yeah. absolutely. And I was like, I hadn't heard about that film. Because I, you know, this is very early on me taking over the, uh, having come from outside the industry back into the industry and trying to catch back up, mm. and so I did a bit of research and I went, no, oh, that that's actually looks really cool from your comment when you're talking to Brent. So I thought, you know, I'll get that film, bought it in, played that, and I thought it was again just a delightful film that was really fun, stop motion animation, something different. Again, it's different movies. It's not just the same thing where there's act one, act two, act three, there's a guy, there's a girl, there's a love scene, there's some, a car blows up. Mm. You know, it was just a really cute little film. Very charming. I thought it was fine. Yeah, very charming. Yeah. Really beautiful. Um, I, I watched it in cinema here, in this, this very room actually, and um, I think it was last January that it played. Mm. And um, there was quite a few people in here actually because it was summer. And it was one of the other options aside from Avatar. And I had a quick chat to a few people as we left the cinema and everyone was like, that was so good. Yeah. And again, the power of marketing. Like I sat there watching it with a family who had come in specifically to see the film Mm. based off the fact that I had marketed the film saying there's this really interesting film and it's great for families. Yep. And she said, I wouldn't have normally chosen this film. But like you said, there was nothing else on. They'd seen Avatar go and see it so it was a good one so i credit you for that thank you very much thanks thank you there you go i'll take the credit i think it's a nice thing also isn't it when someone makes the decision to see a film that they may not necessarily have wanted to see either whether they've looked at it online or they've rocked up to the cinema and they've gone what's on i really admire people that do that Mm. and we do have some people that rock into the cinema here they've got a spare three hours and what's starting next yeah and and they'll just go and see whatever's starting next i think that is Hugely admirable. I yeah. love it. And you're seeing you're seeing that right now in the states with um, you know uh, the boy and the heron yeah. and Godzilla minus one, two Japanese films in Japanese with English subtitles that are topping the American box yep. office right now because there's no mainstream film to fill that void. Yep. The the ones that are out there haven't fired. Yep. And people are looking to they still want to be entertained. Yes. They're just going out and looking at something something different. So and it's cool. and they're probably watching those films and going, man, phenomenal. Yeah, well, Both. Godzilla minus one's just got A plus cinema score, and it's making money on money on money. Boy so. in the Heron, ninety seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. You know, Yao Miyazaki making his return after ten years. There's a really beautiful story behind that. One of the great studios of all time. Mm. Okay, so speaking of Japanese films, specifically animation, one of my favourite films of the year came out in April this year. Uh, was a film called Suzume. Yes. Beautiful. Japanese animated film, fantastical, great for kids and families. Absolutely loved it. Didn't top my list for the year, but it was definitely up there. Going on to also animation, I'm going to stick with animation, and then I'm going to move more into art house. Um, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse may seem like an obvious choice, but when I had my team party the other night, it was about four or five other team members' favorite or top three films of the year. I loved the first film. On your John Wick 4 comment, how can you up the game of an already pretty perfect film? And I think they absolutely did this on this one. Um, Incredible animation. I love that the styles get mixed up with the characters. You've got some kind of collage style. Um, You've got characters from different universes, which just creates its own kind of big world. You know, there's a lot going for that film. And it's got a beautiful fledgling sort of love story in the middle. Um... The voice acting's fantastic. The action scenes are amazing, and the soundtrack's great as well. Yeah, no, that I film. 100% agree. I think that film was great, and it ended on a cliffhanger. I felt like I wish it had just gone on that a little bit longer because I, I wanted more of it. So it was quite good. a long film already. It was it 131 was. minutes, which is long for an animated film. Again, sitting right here, just in front of us, with my daughter and my son watching that movie, 
my daughter and my son both love those films. They can't wait for the third one to come out. And when it came up to be continued at the end, my 10-year-old daughter said, oh, what? <laughs> Pulled that the rug right pretty, from under it. <laughs> that was a pretty good sign that, you yeah. know, that film had really resonated with her. Um, I think certainly with the soundtrack and the ability to have relatable characters, both young and old, male and female, meant that they were hitting all the right markers for how do you, you know, yeah. make someone enjoy a film. Definitely. Okay, now we're moving into festival territory here. We did have the New Zealand International Film Festival here back in August. It was the second year we've done it. Um, managed to catch nine films in the festival, and my two picks from the festival, which have had subsequently wide release runs, were Anatomy of a Fall, which won the Palm d'Or at Cannes this year. Mm -hmm. I loved that film. Not in my top one or two for the year, but it still needs to get a mention. Fantastic acting. A film that really makes you think about relationships. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's basically a court procedural where at the very start of the film, the husband, who's a sort of struggling author, has fallen from the second story of their, their home and lands in the snow, and you've got this very vivid image of red on white, um, and he's discovered by their semi-blind son, versus his wife, who's a very successful author, and it, it talks about in, in, in sort of backstory as you go back into the story about the struggles as a professional, um, competitive profession, um, professionalism and the fact that it's your wife that you're competitive with and did she do it did she not do it did he jump did you know um, and the way that it rolls out through the court procedural actually has you on the edge of your seat it's a beautifully done film it's a tough watch at times but highly recommended if you haven't seen it you must check out Anatomy of a Fall the other one which I saw at the festival which is possibly my favorite film of the year I can't definitively say so is a little film called EO, which came out um, as a wide release film in the last three to four weeks in New Zealand. Uh, it's only 88 minutes, but man, how, how to pack a huge amount of stuff into a very short film, how that film has been done, kind of blows my mind actually. 84-year-old Polish director making a film that feels like it's been made on a really good budget by art school students. It feels like a very young, fresh, hip, slightly punk rock film uh, it's got everything going for it it's got the best and worst of humanity uh, it's beautiful it's disturbing it's shocking it's stunning uh, it's got a great soundtrack and basically the main thread of the film is a donkey by the character name of eo and literally at times you're seeing stuff reflected out of his big beautiful eyes and at times it's just the experience he's going through going from at the start um, as an abused donkey in the circus and then escaping and then finding himself as a football team mascot and then finding himself in a fox farm, you know, um, finding himself lost in the forest with um, laser sights from hunter's rifles crossing him. The imagery, the cinematography is stunning as well. Uh, what a beautiful film. Highly recommended. Probably my top film for the year. Another film that I just loved this year, which played as part of the festival, was Perfect Days, which is a Wim Wenders film set in Tokyo, beautiful meditative um, I lived in Japan so I have these kind of feelings that come back um, and one of the stars of that film is actually the architecture of the toilets in Tokyo so when it comes out in New Zealand cinemas January 25th I highly recommend you see it if that's your bag and my last one is actually an experience speaking of experience is not so much a film that I saw for the first time and I thought was the best it's regarded as one of the worst films of all time um, but I went with my colleague Matthew to um, a screening of The Room at the awesome Hollywood Avondale. And I was, was going to say, it's The Room, isn't it? Greg Sestero, who plays one of the leads, Mark, in the film, was there to Q&A the film. And what an experience. Yeah. It was a sellout, 400 people, and all of the tropes from The Room screenings, which have been happening for the last 20 years since it opened in, in cinemas, actually happened. This film did $1,800 at the US box office when it opened. $1,800. Mm. It, it costs $6 million to make. Yep. It is literally one of the worst but best films you'll ever see. And to see it with an audience shouting out the lines, throwing the spoons, don't worry, that may not make sense, but look it up. And to have one of the lead actors there talking about it and how he was not necessarily an A actor. He's not a Leonardo DiCaprio. He wanted to be, but he never was. And his acceptance in the Q&A telling us that 
this is his story. Yeah. The Room, 20 years later, he's traveling the world to talk about one of the worst films ever made. Yeah. What a time. We loved it. Yeah, I, I've seen The Room. I think it is absolutely um, one of those quintessential must-sees, just purely for how bad it really it's is. It's insane. It's, it's, and it's bad. It's tell us about your bad, your worst. Bad. Speaking of which, tell us about your worst films of 2020. Yeah, nice nice sort of segue to the worst list. And we'll, we'll wrap this up really quickly. I'm not going to go into why I thought they were the worst. I'll just nail why what I thought Real were bad. Off, Okay, so I've got three, five films which I chose, which were um, connected by an actor and by a studio. Okay. Okay. So the two uh, actor ones were Meg Two: The Trench because okay. I just felt that Meg Two failed so much compared to Meg One. Meg One was a great ride. Meg Two was just meh. Uh, and Operation Fortune: Ruse de Guerre. And again, one of those films that had so much potential, but I just felt it did not deliver. Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie, you know? exactly. Guy yeah. Ritchie and Jason Statham. That should have been a winner right from there, but yeah. it just it just didn't fire. Um, and the other one, and this is where the studio comes in, they're all Disney films. Mm. Okay, And I hate to bag on Disney because I have a lot of friends at Disney, but the movies that I felt were, in no particular order, worst of the year, were Indiana Jones, The Marvels, and Ant-Man and The Wasp, okay. Quantumania. And I think that... Marvel had just lost its way for a lot of that, mm. and I think that they need to get themselves together for many, many reasons. We could speak for hours on this, but we won't. And I think that Indiana Jones was just, um, it died on the cutting room floor. Credit that, to Disney. I think they know. I think they, do. they hit the talk from the top. Bob Iger himself, the big boss at Disney, he knows that they've got some work to do, and I think that's that's very admirable that the studio is going okay we need to think about what we're doing and why our films aren't being successful and what we can do better definitely so hopefully 2024 well 2024 disney's got just the one film which is deadpool and then they're going to be really coming back in 2025 so hopefully 2025 is going to be a solid year for disney fingers crossed Boo! Operation Fortune was great! Indiana James was great! Boo Ross! Go Dan! <laughs>